Diane Tavner is the co-founder and CEO of Summit Public Schools, a nationally recognized nonprofit that, organized, that, that operates 15 middle and high schools in California and Washington. She developed a school model centered on real world experiences, self-direction, collaboration, and reflection, preparing all students to succeed in college, thrive in today's workplace, and lead a secure and fulfilled life. Your schools allow students to craft their educations in ways that may strike many as radical. For instance, if I understand correctly, tests aren't given by a teacher to the entire class on the same day. Rather, students choose when to test themselves and tests are generally completed online. And a series of projects replaces traditional textbooks and lectures. Am I right in this description? And can you give our readers a sense of a school day in the life of one of your high school students? Right. Um, so uh, uh, kind of, I think, technically right, but maybe useful to expand on that a little. And through description, we can do that. Um, what I would amplify in what you just said is this idea of the projects. And so maybe where we start is, you know, what, what is most important for kids to learn? And in traditional school, mostly what kids are learning are like facts and information. And we have these traditional tests that sort of test kind of what we gave to them and then they kind of spit it back to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, while their knowledge is still important and knowing some information and facts and terms and stuff is still important, it is not the most important thing today to get kids ready for the future. Mm -hmm. What we would argue is what's most important are these big universal skills so how do you communicate effectively? How do you solve problems? How do you make a claim and an argument and support it with evidence and things like that? And the habits of success. So your you know, ability to persevere through challenge and your ability to manage you know, relationships and things like that. And so the core of the learning experience really are these projects. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about a student's day and their week, the time they're in class with their teacher and their peers, they're really working on these projects. And the projects start with like a big essential question and an enduring understanding that we want kids to have. Like, for example, why do societies engage in revolution? You know, that would be like a big question. And mm -hmm. understanding that kind of across history and in multiple contexts is a really useful big concept for people to get. Now, you can't really understand and explore that if you don't have some knowledge about specific revolutions that have occurred in our world and, you know, what kind of happened there. Um, and there's many ways then to really get at answering that question, which ultimately we would do in a performance task. And so that question, for example, could be something as traditional as you ultimately would write like a timed essay around that, or it could be um, a, a presentation that you share or it could be something really creative like you know you actually translate your understanding of revolution into you know writing a futuristic novel around revolution that incorporated all your understanding of why people came to revolution so there's like tons of different authentic ways that you could express your deep understanding of that and so that's what the projects are about they're helping kids really come to a deep understanding of a big question, big idea, and then perform a task that is real world and authentic that shows that learning. And then those tests that are online that you talked about that are on demand are what knowledge would they need in order to come to that. So like we just said, you know, they would probably need to understand the big revolutions that have happened throughout history and maybe sort of the common causes or circumstances or conditions that would exist for revolution and or what's the technical definition of revolution and so those tests you're right kids take on demand online to to really ba develop that base knowledge and have it so they're applying it in the projects but we don't waste any classroom time on that we let kids learn how to learn and then we give them a playlist that they're really used to in our world kids are really used to having playlists they pick the, the ways that work for them to learn and then they take the assessment online 
that's graded that way. Teachers aren't spending their time on that. And kids have to develop a level of mastery. Otherwise, they don't pass it. So if they don't pass it, they got to go back and study more and come back to it. Um, that help in, happens in what we call self-directed time. And there's some time built into the day, but that basically replaces homework. So when you think about kids in our schools, they don't have like, they don't go to class every day and have a planner where their teacher tells them, here's your assignment for tonight. They actually are thinking about their projects and making a plan of what knowledge do I need to show and have in order to apply to that, apply to my project. And then I go do that in my self-directed time and they really control that schedule. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but that's kind of the starter. We sort of flip things on the, its head of where they're really spending their time. That's great. Um, what is the role of a teacher in that model? Yeah, so, um, you know, if we think about movies and, and sort of these iconic teachers and movies, what we tend to always think about is like that teacher at the front of the classroom who's like the sage on the stage or, the person who's sharing all this wisdom and knowledge to you know, a group of kids who are lined up in desks and rows, that's not the model of teacher um, in the summit in classroom. Um, what a teacher's doing is a few different things. One, they're curating a really good experience. So they're taking these projects and they're making sure that the project is like available to the kids and that it's personalized to them so they know what different kids goals are and they know what different skills kids need to work on and they use the data so that they're helping kids like set themselves up and navigate through the process number one number two they are giving a ton of feedback to the students as they go along and so rather than waiting till the very end like the essay and just grading it there's going to be, it'll be broken down into checkpoints and kids will be doing pieces or parts of these big skills along the way. And the teacher's giving feedback along the way because that's the best way to grow that skill. The teacher's also helping the kids start to understand and look for what they need to be doing in their skills and then helping facilitate them giving feedback to each other in group work and, and things like that. Um, and the teacher is also intervening. So if they notice that a student is missing some knowledge or skills, they're going to intervene there and they're going to help, you know, bolster those skills for a smaller group of kids who, who need that. Um, and or if kids are more advanced, they're going to insert there and help them think about what they can do for extending their learning or advancing their learning. And so they're really going to help customize or differentiate the experience for the students. Um, yeah, so those are some of the roles that teachers will play. So how did you come up with this model after your years working in traditional public schools? Yeah, um, well, there's um, a few things. One, um, we really went back and looked at what we believed the purpose of education was. And you know, what we actually value as we started as a community. And, you know, I happen to live in the Silicon Valley. Um, and so there was a real mindset here of like, we're not preparing kids back then for the 21st century. And, you know, we are a much more global world, a much more connected world. Um, we, um, it's, there's far less sort of rote type work things are starting to get automated and things like that. So what's needed are these big skills and these big habits. And so we looked at our values and our beliefs around the purpose of education, which was to get kids ready for that world, and then therefore college also. And then we looked at the learning science and said, you know, what do we know about the best ways that human beings learn and develop? And a lecture is not the way that most human beings learn and develop, and certainly not the skills we're talking about. So it is hands-on practice, real world, feedback, you know, those are the ways we know from the science that people learn. And so we took those values and our purpose and our, you know, where we wanted kids to end up at the end of 12th grade. And then we designed a from scratch, like, okay, well, what would school look like if we, you know, knowing all of this? 
And then we spent many years just testing and iterating. So we started with that design and we put it into place and then we would collect feedback and data and we would iterate on it. And we just sort of, you know, tinkered our way towards the model that we have today, which we continuously improve. Um, you know, and there are moments where there's sort of these big step changes in the model where we learn something pretty profound, but otherwise it's this constant like improvement that we're doing. I think so many parents worry that if we back off, our kids will do nothing but eat candy and play video games 24 seven. But your school seems to illustrate that teens can thrive with the freedom to chart their own course. So one of the examples in the book was about a group of kids who taught themselves what they needed to know to take an a the AP chemistry exam. What have you learned about trusting teens and their abilities to create their own lives? Yeah, um, so much. Um, and there's a lot wrapped up into that question. So let me take it in two parts, like teens and then parents. So teens, um, I think as a general rule, are capable of so much more than we give them credit for. Um, and, um, you know, to me, uh, most people can name one teen, at least one teen that they've run into that they think is super impressive, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, that teenager is not like a teenager. They're so thoughtful. They're so purposeful. They're, you know, whatever. I actually believe all teens have the capability of being like that. And so um, it's just a matter of giving them the opportunity and the circumstances and the development that enable them to be that way. So those are my beliefs about teenagers. Parents, um, there's a lot of fear as parents. And a lot of our choices and decisions as parents are rooted in fear. And, um, you know, we've gone back and sort of traced the evolution of parenting. And there are markedly different expectations of parents today than there were even 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And um, I think those expectations on us drive a lot of our choices and decisions as parents. And I think that as parents, we are, we feel, and I think we are judged based on what our kids end up doing and becoming. And so our own identities are wrapped up in our kids' success, if you will. Um, and so it's interesting, oftentimes parents will look at our school and they'll say, oh, that's great for kids who know how to make decisions and, you know, are organized and all of that. And I think the misunderstanding there and what we say is actually, you know, no one's naturally born with those skills. They are skills that you can develop and learn, but you have to do that with practice, with opportunity, with feedback. And so what Summit does is help build and develop those skills. And so um, when parents say, well, it wouldn't work for my child because they need a super structured environment because they don't have any of those, our question is always, well, when are they going to get them? Are you going to follow them to college and into their job and into their marriage, you know? And so we're like, now's the time to learn these skills. And this is the environment where we can actually teach them and practice them and develop them um, into those abilities. But it, it requires us as parents to let go a little bit and to... Um, you know, somehow figure out how to control our fear that they're gonna like fail or not be successful or just fall down. So this is a little bit different direction. It can be very frustrating for parents and kids who feel like their schools don't see them or their potential. What you said about believing that we could, that all of our teens could be that person we're so impressed with was really hit that for me. Our school system, for example, places kids on a math track based on one assessment in the fifth grade. What can individual teens and parents do to become empowered or combat these limiting beliefs and structures? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go to your school. <laughs> oh, 
No, um, it's really hard. And it's one of the reasons that I wrote the book because all kids can't go to our schools. And so we're like, what can we actually do? And so, um, you know, I'm going to give two answers. There's one of what can I do as a parent with my child at home? And then there's one, what can I do as a parent as part of a large number of parents who feel really constrained by our existing system. And I think there's activities we can do in both places. So for me and my child, I think that the most important thing that I need to do is, is um, get clear about what I value most. And what we, what we hear from parents is that what they care about is that their kids grow up to have a good life a life that they're doing meaningful and purposeful work and that they have financial security and that they have good relationships and a community and that they're happy, quite frankly. And um, the, the pathway to that good life has three key parts. One, I as a person need to understand what I offer the world. What are my skills? You know, what are my capabilities? What, what do I have to offer? And obviously, I want to build those offerings because that opens more doors. Mm -hmm. Two, I need to understand what I care about and what's meaningful to me. And then I need to take what I offer and what I care about, and I need to find where in the world is that a good fit or a good match. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as parents, that's what we have to focus on as we launch our kids into adulthood is the good match or the good fit. So we got to help our kids and we have to understand who they are, what they care about, what they have to offer. It's more than just math and reading scores. Because mm -hmm. we know that our kids are these amazing human beings on lots of fronts that sometimes don't get recognized. And then we have to look at the good fit, not the brand name. And sometimes what parents get really caught up in is the brand name. Like a brand name college or a, a you know, oftentimes it has a brand name because it has a big football team or, you know, whatever, as opposed to what's actually the good fit for my child's skills and what they bring and what they're passionate about. And so if I would say one thing as a parent, like focus on that, the fit and mm -hmm. not the brand name and then understanding your child and helping them understand themselves. And then the second thing is we as parents need to advocate for a school system that is not simply narrowly focused on math and reading, basically, literally, and stack ranking kids and pitting them against each other and saying, oh, whoever's successful is just who's the fastest and at these two very narrow, you know, skills, as opposed to why don't we have a school system that's looking to see what every child is good at and knows that there's a spot and a place for them and is trying to surface that and find a good fit for them as opposed to just like creaming off the top and, you know, mm -hmm. they go on. So one of the things you said when I heard you speak was that when you realized kids don't want to be saved, but want to have the power to save themselves, that really changed the way you educated. Does this apply to how you parent as well? And can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, my son is a senior in high school this year. And um, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're actually in a really amazing, good place now today but as i think about some of our journey it was incredibly scary and stressful and there were many moments where um you know i either as a mom wasn't paying attention to to him and what he was saying and what he was asking for or um was guided by my fear and sort of trying to compensate or or save him and um, I really had to take the step back often and say, oh, I'm doing it for him or I'm trying to do it for him. And no wonder he's kind of bristling at that and or giving up at that. And there's multiple moments in time when that happens um, or happened. Um, you know, I think one of the great examples from the book was actually my husband who um, had always kind of helped my son with math. 
And then he got into Summit and was, you know, doing the type of learning we talked about earlier. And that meant he didn't have a textbook and, you know, a lot of the learning resources for in different places. And he was, he, need, he got stuck and he asked my husband for help. And my husband didn't know how to help him because he was used to this model of like, I go to the textbook, I flip through, I read really quickly, I remember what it is, and then I can instruct you and you do the worksheet and then you go back to school and it's all good. And none of it worked like that anymore. And my husband got really upset, but it was about fear. When I got to the bottom of it, he was like, I don't know how to be a parent in this model. Like before, I could basically come in and save him. I could make sure his homework got done. But now when we got to the bottom of it, he had to actually just support him in learning, which is what we really wanted, but felt very uncomfortable because we didn't know how to play that role. And it felt like we weren't the expert and we didn't know. And, you know, and so there's been multiple times like that where we have to kind of work as a team to talk ourselves out of kind of swooping in to try to save him. Um, and instead, thinking about how do we coach him and support him and guide him and, you know, not put ourselves into the equation, but make it truly about 